and its symmetry. It's the relationship of the basic concept of symmetry to nature. In fact, what we are trying to do in physics is organize our thinking about nature. It's a, science proceeds by sort of making a bunch of observations, then trying to set, say this thing's bigger than that thing, this thing's stronger than that thing, put them in some kind of order relationships, eventually try to assign numbers to this. That thing's 10 times bigger than that thing. That thing is one third the strength of that thing. We need units, centimeters, grams, seconds, and so forth to start doing that. Then the ultimate thing is to have some organizing principle, some principle that says, well, there's a reason why that thing is 10 times the mass of that thing, because it's got 10 of those in it. And you begin to, to see that atoms, for example, increase in mass because they have more neutrons and protons inside of them. That's a profound thing, that the at atomic structure was not understood until the 20th century. And with that comes enormous capability, then, to put it to work. That's not really our goal in science. We're trying to understand it. But it's always been the case that when we understand it, we can put it to work. So it always proceeds in those four, four layers. Uh, back in the 1960s, when all these elementary particles were being produced and nobody had a clue what is a rho meson, what's an omega, what is a phi meson, what is a delta resonance of the proton. So all these things were being seen at accelerator laboratories. The field was very much in a classification era. How, how, what, what are these objects? First of all, let's make a list. And what's the relationship between those objects and those objects? And uh, eventually we could put them into groups and say these objects will always be heavier than those objects because they, they're in the same sort of collection. And then eventually the big breakthrough came around 19, well, 63 through 72, we realized the reason for this complexity is that those particles that were being made had tiny things inside of them called quarks. And that the quarks were actually photographed, if you like, for the first time in about 1970 at the Stanford Linear Accelerator. And that was the beginning of a deeper level of understanding. What are quarks? What governs their rules? And now we're back to a pattern. We've got six quarks, up, down, charm, strange, top and bottom. Top is very, very heavy. Up is very, very light. We don't have a clue. Why? What's, what, we don't even know how to organize them at this point. We know they sort of come in pairs and three sets of pairs and so forth. But what are the rules that are governing this? And we're searching for organizing principles. And it's not that we're completely random in our approach. We build on success. And we have discovered that there's something called symmetry principles that govern organizing principles. So that we use symmetry to try to figure out, well, if I put all the quarks together in one thing and I can rotate the top of my head into a charm, and then I have some sort of symmetry relationship between them, then to understand the mass difference, I have to understand what could generate a breaking of that symmetry. That's how we think about it. Symmetry has become fundamental to our understanding of the basic laws of physics, and that's not going to change. It's going to stay that way forever. We've really uncovered one of nature's basic light motifs, as they say in the there. There's a basic theorem that I want to tell you about today. It's a mathematical theorem that connects symmetry directly to the laws of physics. It takes this mathematical concept and just connects it directly to the laws of physics. And the deeper we go, the more it just defines the laws of physics for us. And it's called Noether's theorem. And it was discovered in the 20th century. And I think it is as important to us as the Pythagorean theorem. The two most important theorems in nature are the Pythagorean theorem, which defines sort of what we call metric geometry, the concept of distance in any, whether space is curved or flat or whatever, you, you basically start with something like the Pythagorean theorem. And Noether's theorem that, that basically brings the symmetry principles into the laws of nature. So Noether was one of the greatest mathematicians who ever lived. She's a woman, born in the 19th century, didn't live very long. She is the first person to break through the glass ceiling in the German academic system. The German academic system from the mid-1800s to about 1930 was the preeminent place in the world. It was the place you went if you really wanted to make it 
in almost all disciplines. Mathematics, physics, chemistry, music, even art, architecture, and so forth. You wanted to be to go to one of the German universities. And it was an incredibly liberal environment where anybody who was good at what they did would, would make it as, uh, in, in that environment. But they had this problem of, uh, of uh, gender bias that, that prohibited women from becoming essentially professors. And Emmy Noether was the first person to, to break through. She had a little help from some friends who recognized how profound her theorem was and how profound her work was. And uh, they wrote letters uh, continually to the, to the rest of the staff at the University of Göttingen, Germany, where she was. That's where, that's where Hilbert, who was considered the greatest mathematician of the era, lived. Uh, that's where Heisenberg was from. He was there then. Uh, so quantum mechanics and, and, and topology, Felix Klein was there. The topologists were all there. Uh, had this great mathematics, physics department, and, and that's where she was uh, finally promoted, uh, I think in about 1931. And the next year, some awful things started happening in Germany, and they fired basically everybody who was a uh, minority, woman, uh, whatever, on the faculty, and, and she had to leave Germany. And she was lucky to be able to come to Bryn Mawr University, where she lectured, and uh, also at Princeton until her untimely death in 35. So what is symmetry? Well, you sort of know it when you see it. Uh, here's an example of it. I actually took this picture, I think in 1981, and it ended up in our book. And that's why you should always keep pictures that you take. If you ever want to write a book, you're much better off putting your own pictures in the book, because it takes forever to get permission to put somebody else's picture in a book. And it's really hard to get permission to put a picture of Albert Einstein in a book, so we didn't even bother. Uh, but this is the famous Taj Mahal. And as you can see, the architects uh, have built into this uh, many different symmetries. It's a remarkable building. It's actually a tomb uh, uh, it was built by a, a, a Muslim king uh, in northern India for his deceased wife. And it is a, a remarkable structure in many ways. But, but the main point I want to make is it has a symmetry whereby I can identify an axis that sort of slices through the middle of the building. And I can imagine a mathematical mapping of every point to the left of this axis into every point, into another equivalent point on the right, and vice versa. So if, the, if you had a lot of construction workers and they could go and remove a little piece of marble here and haul it over here and put it in there and vice versa, put that piece there and so forth, and do that quickly, you'd end up with the same Taj Mahal. So what you see here is there's a, something we call an operation that you can perform, either get your construction workers to do this physically or actually imagine it mathematically or abstractly, that, that, that maps points from left to right and, and right to left and preserves what we call the invariance, the unchanging quality. It preserves the form of the Taj Mahal, which you started with, you get back again. Notice that in this picture, there are things like clouds that were a little bit lopsided that day, and they break the symmetry. So that cloud ends up looking like that cloud. But the Taj Mahal has the symmetry, and that's what we're focused on. So symmetries involve, well, if we ask for a definition, I, I've taken this poll. I could probably take it with you to define it. And the sorts of things I get are answers like things that look the same when you see them from different points of view. It's like the sides or angles of an equilateral triangle, they're all the same. Different parts of an object look the same, like eyes and ears of a face. But a more scientific or precise way of saying it is there's an invariance or an unchanging quality of a system or object under a transformation or a collection of transformations. So what we just looked at was one transformation. The object was the Taj Mahal. It didn't change when we did the transformation of reflection about the axis. And notice that what really underlies all of this is the most fundamental thing in mathematics, an equal sign. Taj Mahal before symmetry operation equals Taj Mahal after symmetry operation. So this is a form of things you can do to preserve that, that, are, that, that preserve what we call an equivalence class, makes before and after are equivalent to each other under the symmetry. 